If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. I'm excited to be in this epic Jesus League series where we are looking at the books of the New Testament in our Bible, that portion of our Bible. If you're new, coming in new, it's after the Old Testament. We're looking at the writers, who they were, the witnesses to Jesus Christ to give you a little background on what's going on here so that you better understand it. Last week, Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. This week, Mark. And so I have to say, that was beautifully timed. <clears throat> so I have to say, <laughs> it was it's in sync. Um, I'll stop dialoguing now. <clears throat> so I want to draw your attention to our Mark series, our Mark resource for those of you who've been with us for a long time, you know that we were in a series on the gospel according to Mark all last season, and we created a resource called Mark for Millennials. If you haven't gotten it yet, you can pick up, just take it for free at the info desk. It will help you to understand the background behind this gospel account. There was really mainly a twofold purpose there. One, to demonstrate that the gospels are real history. These are real historical documents, and Jesus is who he says he is. He did what the gospel said he did. So there's a lot of historical information there. Two, just to provide an easy-to-read version of the gospel. Some people get a little confused, and there are tons of different versions out there. We just kind of had our own in-house church version that we put out. It's a short gospel account, 16 chapters, no big deal. History is really important. I mentioned this a few weeks ago, that just 50 years ago, most Americans held to a Judeo-Christian worldview. That was the primary worldview that we had here in America. Today, obviously, is very, very, very different. We have a lot of different worldviews, a lot of people saying different things. And the point of this project was to prepare our young people. If we don't equip them, they have a better chance of leaving the church. How do I know? I did. I left the church. I was confronted with the simple question. How do you know <laughs> what you believe is right and what I believe is wrong? And then furthermore, what my professor says is right and what that other professor says is right and this other worldview and this other worldview and the news, you know, <laughs> how do you know? I was presented with opposing worldviews and the opponents had better explanations than I did. They spent more time thinking about it. So my faith was not built on a firm foundation of knowledge of the truth, which we'll be discussing today. I have a teenage daughter, and I don't want her to have to go through that. All right? It was an unnecessary detour that I took in my life. So I'm going to recommend, if you haven't seen it, Mark for Millennials. It answers a lot of questions. It gives you a lot of historical background. It'll help you out. Relationship is key. That's the key here, a relationship with Jesus Christ. But facts are also very, very important. If you really love someone, you'll care about the facts about them, surrounding them. You'll be prepared to defend that person. 1 Peter 3.15, this is not a suggestion. It's a biblical mandate, and it honors Jesus. Look at the text, 1 Peter 3.15, but honor the Messiah, Christ Jesus, as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. However, people miss this part, do this with gentleness, respect, keeping your conscience clear, so that when you are accused, those who denounce your Christian life will be put to shame. This says that when we are confronted with opposing views, we should be ready to defend our faith and that this honors Jesus. The word for defend there is apologia in Greek. We're not going to get fancy, but you're going to hear this word. Maybe you've heard it. Apologetics. All right? It's mispronounced, but that's okay. <laughs> Apologetics. We're going to talk about that today. It's making a defense for something we believe. I said this again <clears throat> a few weeks ago. I think that our world today is more like the biblical world than America was 50 years ago. They were always having to make a defense for what they believe. Just read Acts. <laughs> That's just what it is. They're going around making a defense for what they believe. 
The fact that the Bible exists in the first place is very clear and obvious call to knowledge and understanding. But why? What for? 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and for training in righteousness. This is how we know what it is we should be doing and applying in our lives. We just came out of a series on Philippians, so we'll go there. Maybe you're more familiar with it, even if you're new. So in this series, remember, Paul is in prison for what? For the sake of the gospel, right? <clears throat> but it doesn't just apply to him. Check this out. First Philippians, I'm sorry, Philippians 1, 7. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because I have you in my heart, and you are partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and establishment of the gospel. For God is my witness how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment, so that you can approve the things that are superior and can be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. He prays the church grows in knowledge and considers them partners with him in the defense of the gospel. Apologetics is not optional. 1 Peter 3.15. It's not a letter to one person. It's a general epistle, as they call it. It's to the church. It's to everyone. It's to all of us. We can't just take the scriptures that we like and support what we want to be doing and then throw these out. It doesn't work that way. Knowledge of the Bible is extremely important because it is what we use to define what Christianity is. You can try it without the Bible, without knowledge like I did. But I have the same concern for all of you that Paul did for the church. He writes about it constantly. Philippians 3.1 Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write to you again about this is no trouble for me, and it is a protection for you. Watch out for dogs. Watch out for evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. Here he's referring to false teachers that will try to lead the Philippians astray. If you don't have knowledge of the Bible, it will be easy for people to lead you astray with bad teachings. In Acts, Paul is talking to his overseers in Ephesus. Here's what he says, Acts 20, 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock that the Holy Spirit has appointed you to as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves, see a theme there, will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And men will rise up from your own number with deviant doctrines to lure the disciples into following them. Knowledge of the Bible is a protection against this. This is a concern addressed all over the New Testament, a huge theme. And it is rightly a very serious concern for me as your pastor. Correct scriptural understanding helps build a solid foundation for our faith. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Those themes, faith and belief in the gospel of Mark. Very strong theme. So let's just define it first. Faith. Complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Belief. An acceptance that a statement is true or that something exists. Faith simply means to have trust in something that you already know exists. Belief is an acceptance of a statement that is true, that you know exists. The Bible exists so that we can have knowledge of the evidence and then have faith that Jesus exists. Remember, living in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. If you were with us for the Philippians series, we looked at that. One of the things that was said by Paul the Apostle. See if you notice something else. We looked at this verse or these verses in that series. Philippians 1, starting at verse 27. Just one thing. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you 
that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, working side by side for the faith that comes from the gospel. Where does faith come from? Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes through the message about Christ, the gospel. So let's grow in knowledge and love this morning. Taking a look at Mark. What is the gospel according to Mark? Or the book of Mark. So gospel can be used in two ways. Don't let that confuse you. There's the gospel, the facts about Jesus Christ. And then they call those first four books of the New Testament the gospels because they're presenting the gospel message. It's an ancient Greco-Roman biography about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Was that complicated? <laughs> We're going to talk about literary genre. I've discussed this before, <clears throat> so I just want to kind of breeze over it this morning. Just a few of the simple facts here. Uh, you can look into more of it in the book. The book is really not complicated. It's meant to, meant to really simplify things, so don't be scared. <laughs> so we have to understand common objections, right? Like if you're going to play any sport, if you're going to play a game, if you're going to have a debate, you have to go in prepared knowing what the enemy is going to use against you, right? Makes sense? So we have to do the same thing with even very basic level apologetics if we're going to be fulfilling that first Peter 3.15 and not ignoring it. So here are one of, well, two of the most common objections to the New Testament portion of the Bible, the whole thing. They'll say these two things about it. One, it is written in all these different languages, right? It's like a big game of telephone, and so we don't know what it really said. Maybe you've heard that. The answer? Wrong. Moving on. <laughs> I can look at <clears throat> and read the ancient Greek manuscripts. One language, Greek, English. If you want to know your Bible really well, learn Greek. Not easy, but <laughs> that's the original language. It's a little different from modern Greek, yes, but you can study and learn ancient Greek and look at those manuscripts. There are differences in them, in the copies, but they change nothing about the gospel, nothing about core doctrine. I don't want to get fancy, but if you've studied this stuff, it's like movable news. Just really simple sentence structure issues and like this, it's, it's not a big deal. It changes nothing about what it said, but they'll use that. They'll say, oh, there's all these little different, and it's, it's not important. It does not change the gospel. Second thing, it was written a long time after the events, right? So how do we know it's true? Answer, wrong. <laughs> it was pretty close. Mark itself is written in a witness period by someone who's probably a witness. Matthew was a witness. John, we'll look at that, was a witness. Luke interviewed very carefully a lot of witnesses. So this sounds silly, but back then they didn't have the internet, right? Unfortunately, we learn about things before they happen somehow on the internet. It's, it's pretty interesting how that works, isn't it? <clears throat> they didn't have it. They just had dial-up. So things took a long time. <laughs> we have to compare it to other things in a similar literary genre, right? Writings in the same style, written about the same time. We can't compare it to now. It's not like now. So I like to use Alexander the Great. If you've been around for a long time, I use this as a person of history and compare it to Jesus. So we have to look at the writings about him. Alexander the Great died in 323 BC. So this is simple stuff to try to commit to memory. Yet nothing was written about him until 100 AD. Do the math. It's about 400 years after he died. Nothing like the Gospels are to Jesus. There's one earlier writing, but that's still around 300 years after he died. The earliest little snippet. Until we get Life of Alexander by Plutarch, which is kind of like the Gospels are to Jesus. We're waiting 400 years. Let that sink in. Okay, logical question. What about Mark? When do we get Mark? About 40 years. That's how much better it is. 40 years in a witness period. So if we believe Alexander the Great existed, well, <laughs> we should believe that Jesus existed from that historical standpoint. Remember, a lot of these things that I'm saying this morning, 
I'm taking into consideration that I'm having an argument with someone who doesn't believe. And I shouldn't even say argument. I'm having a dialogue, remember? With gentleness, respect, and love. So you don't want to fight with people about this stuff. Just the facts. All right? And a lot of it's for your own faith, for your own knowledge. I want to equip you with just short answers so you can address the common objections. And I can stop getting 500 emails a week. <laughs> Email me anytime. So who was Mark? He was John Mark. He appears a lot, actually, <clears throat> in the New Testament. He's not an apostle. He was probably a witness in this sense, which is really funny. In the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, you'll notice when Jesus is being arrested, there's a commotion. And there's this certain young man who tries to get away. Well, he gets away. He's successful in it, but he doesn't keep his clothing. <laughs> he runs away naked. So it's kind of funny, naked Mark. He's a certain young man. <laughs> Scholars say by the way he words this that that's probably him. We do know he appears in Acts, so we do know he was a young man then. <clears throat> People assemble at his mother's house to pray in Acts chapter 12. This is where Peter goes when he's released from prison by the angel. At the end of chapter 12, he joins Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journey. But he abandons them. And this causes them to have a fight over it when they want to, or I guess he wants to come along again. Barnabas wants him to come along. They get into a fight. Paul says, no, nope, he ditched us. I'm not taking him. I don't want to know about Mark. Barnabas says, no, I'm taking him. So they split over it. Paul takes Silas. Barnabas takes Mark. This probably happens because Barnabas and Mark are cousins. So it's his relative. He's standing up for him. We confirm this fact in Colossians 4.10. But here's the cool thing. We know that Mark reconciles with Paul because in later letters like 2 Timothy 4 and Philemon, you'll see that Paul says that Mark is useful to him in ministry. In 1 Peter, I believe 1 Peter 5, Paul says that Mark is as a son to him. And indeed, <clears throat> scholars think that this is where, well, we know from early church fathers wrote about it, this is where Mark gets most of his source material that he wasn't there for through Peter, the lead disciple's teaching. So he was really close. A little minor story of redemption in there that I think is interesting. Looking for themes, themes in Mark. Here's where we're going to get into it. First, we cannot ignore immediately. <laughs> it's like the gospel of immediately. If you're comparing all the different gospels, Mark is like a really fast-moving version of the gospel of Matthew. It feels fast. It's just a whole bunch of snapshots of ministry and then the final Passion Week. That's what it runs like. It doesn't have the genealogy like Matthew does. It doesn't have the long Sermon on the Mount, three chapters there. It just moves really fast through ministry snapshots. But it's not just that. You'll see that the calling of the first disciples happens immediately. Mark 1, 17. Follow me, Jesus told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little further, <clears throat> excuse me, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in their boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. As you read Mark, you'll notice that all but one of Jesus' healings is immediate. Here's an example, just in the first chapter. Mark 1.40. Then a man with a serious skin disease came to him on his knees, begged him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I'm willing, he told him, be made clean. Immediately, the disease left him and he was healed. <clears throat> so what about that partial healing? Let's take a look at that in Mark 8. So about halfway through. We get halfway through Mark's gospel account <clears throat> and we see but there's a partial healing here. So I just want to go over it. In Mark's gospel, you have the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. All right, so this is the multiplication, right, of the loaves of bread. He, feel, he feeds these multitudes. So a kind of funny thing happens. They're done. <laughs> they get in the boat to leave, and they notice, oh, we only have one loaf with us. And they start freaking out, right, and discussing, like, what are we going to do? We don't have any food. And Jesus is like, like, D didn't you see what I did? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's kind of crazy. So 
here's what he says, Mark 8, starting at verse 14. They had forgotten to take bread and only had one loaf with them in the boat. He commanded them, watch out, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. So read the Mark for Millennials book for more on that. We don't have time. They were discussing among themselves that they did not have any bread. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you discussing that you do not have any bread? Don't you understand or comprehend? Is your heart hardened? Do you have eyes and not see? Do you have ears and not hear? And do you not remember? Like five minutes ago. Then Jesus gives them a pop quiz, like on how many loaves he multiplied. It's really funny. Read it. After this, this is important. Jesus encounters a blind man. So remember, it's just these fast snapshots, one thing after the next. Mark 8, 22. Then they came to Bethsaida. They brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and brought him out of the village, spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him. Gross. He asked him, do you see anything? The man looked up and said, I see people. They look to me like trees walking. Again, Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes and he saw distinctly. He was cured and could see everything clearly. Notice, this healing is not immediate like the others. There's a little lag. After this, right after this, Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. Who do you say I am? But you, he asked them again, Mark 8, 29. Who do you, you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. So the partial healing of the blind man is an interesting object lesson of sorts. It's placed intentionally right in between these two things. Right? It says, like Mark 8:18, 8, do you have eyes and not see? Do you have ears and not hear? Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah is an awakening to this. Now he can see. At first you were blind, worried about the loaves. Now you can see. The only one that isn't immediate. That is the theme of immediately in the Gospel of Mark. So here's where we're really going this morning. The theme of, or themes of, repent and believe. It begins with repentance. John the baptizer paving the way with it. Jesus calling for it. Right at the beginning. Mark 1.1. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It's a part of the first thing Jesus says in Mark's gospel account. Look at Mark 1, 14. After John was arrested, and again, for these details like the spitting in the eyes, John getting arrested, Mark for Millennials, it's all in there. It actually answers a lot of common questions in a very simple way for you. Jesus went to Galilee, preaching the good news of God. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Repent and believe. Now, you guys are getting really uncomfortable right now because I'm saying repent a lot. (laughs) Repent. That's my mic check that I do. The worship team loves it. They're like, please say that in church. And I said, no, it's not allowed anymore. You can't say repent in church any longer. It's not a scary word. <laughs> We're going to look at, at it today. What does repent mean? <laughs> it means to change and turn from something. That's it. Change and turn from something. It's like being in a bad relationship, right? We can't experience the blessings of a good relationship until we get out of the bad one. Right? We can't experience that relationship. Maybe we can be in two relationships. We'll discuss that. But it's not going to be healthy. It's not going to be good. It's not going to be true. You have to get out of the bad relationship first to experience the true blessings. If we're rejecting God, we're in a relationship with the devil. Somebody else I'm not supposed to talk to in church, talk about in church. He's abusive. He's a liar. He's a cheater. So... If we're tired of being lied to, cheated on, abused, we'll turn from that relationship and go to Jesus. To be in right relationship with the Lord means that we have to repent. We have to do that first. We have to change. We have to dump the abusive ex 
and enter into a right relationship with Jesus. We can't be in a relationship with both. Mark 6, 24. No one can be a slave of two masters, since either he will hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot be slaves of God and money. So money is the example of the thing that needs to be turned from. We'll look at that again in a moment. But he calls for people to turn from their sin and repent. Then we see that Jesus applauds, criticizes, and challenges belief. So we get a good look at this in a story most of you probably know. Mark 10, 17. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good but one, God. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your mother and father. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these from my youth. Then looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But he was stunned at this demand, and he went away grieving because he had many possessions. Jesus calls him to change and challenges his faith. If you really believe me, you'll put your money where your mouth is. It's not necessarily the call for everyone, not that we're not called to Jesus, but away from money. But this was this man's favorite sin, right? This is, we all have a favorite one. <laughs> this is his favorite sin. Jesus is calling us out of that to repent. That's the point. So let's look at some examples of how Jesus applauds and criticizes faith in Mark's gospel. We'll start with applause, and we're going to move quickly through this. It's going to be kind of a representation of Mark's gospel account itself. Quick, so there's a paralytic man, and he's carried on like, let's just call it a stretcher. They call it a mat in the Bible, but think of it like a stretcher, something you'd carry someone on who can't move. There's four men carrying him. They want to get him in to see Jesus, right? But it's crowded. The house he's in is really, really crowded. So what do they do? What any of us would do in this situation, we go up on the roof, and we cut a hole in the roof, and then we let him down. Just a little insurance claim. <clears throat> Mark 2, 5. Seeing their faith... Jesus told the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And we jump ahead a little bit. We see this, Mark 2, 11. I tell you, get up, pick up your mat, and go home. Immediately, he got up, picked up the mat, and went out in front of everyone. As a result, they were all astounded and gave glory to God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. In the fifth chapter, this is cool. We see a woman, well, that's not cool, that she's bleeding perpetual kind of bleeding that she has. She reaches out in a crowd thinking like, if I could just touch his cloak, I'll be made well. Crazy faith. What does Jesus say? He feels the power go out from him. She's healed. Mark 5, 34. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be free from your affliction. Cool. Where does he criticize? This is the fun part. In the ninth chapter of Mark, so we have the transfiguration happening. He comes down off the mountain and he runs into this scene. His disciples are trying to heal a boy who's demon-possessed and it's flopping him all around, throwing him in the water and the fire, trying to kill him. The disciples try to heal him and they can't. What does Jesus say? Mark 9, 19. He replied to them, You unbelieving generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him to me. <laughs> Can't talk to you guys like that, can I? <laughs> Don't do that. Near the very end of Mark's gospel account, after his crucifixion, he rises from the dead. He appears to Mary Magdalene and two men. They tell the disciples what happens. They don't believe them. Jesus shows up, Mark 16, 14. Later, 
Jesus, appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. He rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart. See, hardness of heart comes up a lot too. Because they did not believe those who saw him after he had been resurrected. The unbelief of the disciples was rebuked because they heard the message but did not believe it. Ultimately, Jesus wants us to turn from our ways, come into faith, and follow him. He wants us to break down those walls of pride, that's what it is, turn from the sin so that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit who can then guide us in right living. I just want to pause for a moment on this because a lot of people don't believe this. They don't believe it. They don't believe that God, the Holy Spirit, all right, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, has the power to change them. They spend a lot of time trying to do everything on their own. Me too. But when I let go, pray, God, help me. Remember what Heather said? Help. It's a four-letter word. We have to ask God for it. This isn't in my sermon. It's something that's just come into my mind. I believe that God is saying these people need to hear this today, Gene. I had a conversation with my wife. It was amazing. It's a beautiful thing. We were talking about it. We're like, okay, I almost want to get her to come up here and say this. I really used to say, why bother reading when you can just watch the movie? I said that. Like, did I say a lot? Like, all the time. Yes, I was an author. There were a lot of pictures in the martial arts books, and other people edited them, you know? <laughs> they weren't like real books, okay? So I liked writing about things, but I didn't like reading. I never read anything. If you asked me to read a book, it was, did you just say the other day that was like a form of torture? Asking me to read a book was a form of torture. I hated it. You see, I had a form of dyslexia through childhood. So I thought it was really stupid. It really did. Because I'd be sitting there in a classroom and they didn't have like all these things that they have now. You can talk about AD, this, that. And they have all these different diagnoses. You know what they had? You're stupid and lazy. Get back to work. That's it. You got a smack on the back of the head, not a pill. That's how it worked. I was stupid. I was lazy. I would be in a classroom looking around. I didn't understand what was happening. Nothing. I passed through school because I was a really good musician at the time. I'm not boasting. I'm just saying, like, I was in a good band. All the teachers. I went to public speaking in English. They let me play guitar for the class. They did. She's like, he's not gonna, he's not gonna go to college. Whatever. I was already playing in bars <laughs> at 16 years old. It's not, I'm not joking. We were joking about it. I have a tattoo on my arm that I try to cover up. Somebody asked me this morning, like, how did that, is there a story behind that? I said, yes, stupidity. <laughs> that's, you know, that's what happens when you let a 16-year-old drink in bars. You know what I mean? Like, you're going to end up with crazy tattoos on your body. Being real with you guys this morning. Real. Now what do I do? I write books. I read, how many hours a day do I read? On average. A lot. A lot. I'm like obsessed with books. I admit it. I'm a bookaholic. I spend way too much money on books. How did that happen? Pray tell. Did I go to English classes? Did I, you know, did I, did I take some, did I go to, you know, something, to, did I take drugs for, for, for the dyslexia or whatever? No. Being honest with you. That's God. That's all God. We're talking about a lot of people don't share their stories. I'm just feeling led to do this right now. I'm sorry if we go a little bit over. That's God. I'm giving glory to God. I did not, I'm not a hyper-educated person. I can read Greek. How do you go? I mean, it's all Greek to me, right? There's an expression like that for a reason. It's really, really hard. I'm not going to lie. No, I can't read Greek perfectly and fluently, but... I'm up to about 80% of the page now. How? It's not on my power. I, didn't, I took minimal, you go through seminary, you don't learn Greek in seminary. Pastors butcher Greek words like crazy. You don't learn it there. It takes years to learn Greek. How? God. 
God, I'm not boasting. It's not me. <laughs> I'm telling you, I hated reading. And now all I want to do is learn how to read Greek so I can see what the Holy Spirit transmitted through these people in the original writing so that I can share it with you and be a better pastor to you guys. Gene, what does this mean? Let me see. That's it. That's for you, to the glory of God. So listen, if that's you this morning and you're trying to force this fake repentance is what it is. It's fake. Let go. You can't do it on your own. I didn't. I didn't even notice that it happened. I could tell you story after story about things about me. My wife could tell you. This is a different person. A really different person. It's not me. I didn't even notice it. You know? Don't force it. Let go. Because whether you want to think about this or not, you're holding on to the sin. (laughs) That's why I say favorite sin for a reason. You're holding on to it. Let go. And just let God do his thing. It's going to be okay. I was scared too. The purpose of what is written by Holy Spirit through these men, the Jesus League that we're talking about, it was written by Paul in his letter to Titus. Titus 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to build up the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. To build up our faith and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. The truth is that Jesus Christ died on a cross according to scriptures written long ago about him. Then he rose from the dead, appeared to many witnesses who wrote a record of it that is now in our Bibles. They're the Jesus League we're talking about. His death was for the forgiveness of sins, for our offense against God. His resurrection gives us hope that we too will rise from the dead and have eternal life with God through Jesus Christ. Even if this is your first time in church this morning, you know what? You've just heard the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look, we learn from Mark that no matter how you mess up (laughs) No matter how far you go, think about it. He abandoned Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journey. You could say he fell away. But there was redemption for him, right? Think about it, right? You go on a mission trip, and you're like, I'm out. (laughs) This is too rough. I'm done with the shipwrecks, the beatings, all that stuff. I'm out. Read Acts. It's crazy. Don't blame him. He falls away. Then he goes on to write one of the four gospel accounts that's in the Bible. Look, we can be used by God to accomplish amazing things. If you've strayed, I hear this all the time, if you've strayed, (laughs) you have not gone too far. It's impossible to do that. You can't do that. God's too big for that. He's way too big for that. If you have not been in a relationship with God, if you've been in a relationship with the enemy and you're tired of it, if that's you today, you're just tired of it. You're tired of the abuse. You're tired of the shame. You're tired of being cheated on. If you're tired of being lied to, if you feel dirty, if that's you today, I'm here to tell you, Jesus is saying, come to me. Dump them. Dump him. Come to me. Come into a right relationship where there will be real blessings. He's calling you into a new and better relationship. He's calling you to do something that might have sounded scary before, but I hope people, I put myself out there enough, use myself to let you know, yes, it's scary. (laughs) That's not easy. But neither is that, really, right? Don't be scared. Repentance is a beautiful thing. It's not just 
giving something up. It's receiving something better. Let me pray for you guys. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this time. If there are those who are hearing my voice right now, and they're feeling you tug on them, Lord, I pray that they would just come to you, that their walls of pride would break down enough so that they can take the blinders off and see something better in you, Lord. That they would believe whatever it takes in their minds and their hearts Let me be a tool used by you, Lord. Continue to use me. Give them the love, the information, the knowledge that firm faith is built on so that they can come into relationship with you, that they see the value of a changed person knowing Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I ask this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.